Okay, let's take a minute and examine this picture from our text and consider how we see all of these different um, themes of biology in here. What's listed in this picture are what we consider the characteristics of life. And you know from your intro bio that you can't just have one of these characteristics in order to be considered a living thing. That it's really necessary that you have all of these characteristics. For example, um, you might say that a rock can respond to the environment in that it can be broken down by weathering, um, strong winds might move it, water might shape it, all of those things. But a rock can't regulate. A rock can't process energy. Therefore, it is not a living thing. This is one of the key conundrums as well with viruses, in that viruses can do many of these different characteristics of life, and yet they're not considered a living thing, although it's hotly debated, because they can't go through this simple process of reproduction, which is deemed necessary for um, to be considered a living thing. So if we look at these different characteristics, primarily we have order. Okay, and that order is underlied and governed by DNA. It's really the DNA that determines the order of living things. Everything from how you look to how you're put together, where your arms grow, where eyes are placed, all of those things are controlled by your DNA by different genes. Evolutionary adaptation, living things must be able to evolve. They must be able to become better suited to their environment. And this, ad this evolutionary adaptation does not occur within an individual's lifespan. This isn't me saying, you know, it's kind of cold outside today. I'm going to add on an extra coat. This kind of evolutionary adaptation is dealing with your genes. Okay? And you can't change your genes. You're stuck with them. Whatever mom and dad gave you, sorry. That's what you've got to work with. But what genes get passed on through um, sexual reproduction to the next generation, that's evolutionary adaptation. And if natural selection is allowed to play out, then only those genes that really give their um, owner an advantage are going to be passed on to the next generation. It's critical that living things respond to the environment and engage in a process of homeostasis. Okay. Homeostasis meaning maintaining some sort of internal conditions. And it's really that environment, that interaction between the external and the internal where homeostasis becomes key, right? You're responding to your environment, whether it's a photo period, the length of sunlight available during a day um, for different plants growing or to cue different insects or mating seasons, whether it is the amount of rainfall and moisture to tell the plant to close its stomata, the tiny openings in its leaves that per that allow gas exchange, but also let water vapor out. If it's really dry outside, the plant needs to take in that information, close those stomata so it's not losing too much water. Okay, All of those are examples of response to the environment. They can be responding to an internal stimuli, such as hunger, or um, if your blood sugar level rises, your body is going to secrete insulin. Your pancreas is going to produce insulin in order to bring those sugar levels back down to convert that sugar from glucose in your body to glycogen and, and store that sequester it away because high levels of sugar in your body can be damaging to some of your internal organs and to that process of homeostasis. Basis. That's an internal stimulus, okay? Hunger, high blood sugar, even low blood sugar. These are internal stimuli. External stimuli would be that external environment. So anything from a change in seasons to the amount of sunlight available during a day, those are all external stimuli. Reproduction comes in two flavors. We have asexual reproduction which gives you a great evolutionary kickoff because 100% of your genes get passed on. Okay, So if the point of, of reproduction is then to pass on your genes, asexual reproduction you ensure that you don't have to share. 100% of your genes, 100% of your DNA gets passed on to your offspring. And this works well for some organisms and it works well in times where the environment is really stable. When the environment becomes dynamic, Okay? meaning either anything from climate change to new predators to disease, then we really favor a climate where sexual reproduction occurs, Okay, where we have male and female sperm and egg coming together because in sexual reproduction, we increase diversity. And if we increase diversity then we increase opportunities for some of those offspring to survive. It's like not putting all of your eggs into one basket. You really want to increase that diversity so that some of them survive. 
Okay? This is part of the problem with endangered species. As we reduce and reduce and reduce the population, then we don't have as much um, genetic diversity in those individuals to recombine in new ways, and they become more susceptible to disease and, and to extinction because of that. Sexual reproduction does have some um, drawbacks, however, and that only 50% of your DNA gets passed on. You've got to share with that other person, with that other partner. So only 50% of your genetic material gets, gets passed on. Growth and development, all living things go through this process of growth and development. Living things all start as a single cell. Okay. And then, um, again, it varies for different individuals, and we have different types of growth and development um, in different speeds. Remember, those R and K-selected um, life histories and lifestyles. Energy processing, energy flows. So there's two aspects of energy processing that we'll discuss in this course, um, and that all living things must engage in one or the other or both. Okay. The first is that process of photosynthesis. of taking that sun's energy, harnessing it in the chloroplast, in green plants, and in some bacteria, harnessing that chemical energy and converting it, I'm sorry, harnessing that solar energy and converting it into chemical energy in the form of glucose and simple sugars, okay? That is photosynthesis. Kind of the opposite of photosynthesis would then be cellular respiration or respiration. And in respiration, we're taking that glucose we're taking those simple sugars, and, and we're going to also use fats and proteins and other organic molecules for this. Um, the primary one we think about is, is glucose, because we're talking about photosynthesis and respiration. But we're taking those things and we're breaking them down to produce the energy for cellular work, which is ATP. Glucose is big, it's cumbersome, it's hard for your body to really work with. If we can break it down into ATP, it's like breaking it down into to pocket change so that your cells and organelles can use it quite quickly for chemical reactions reactions. And the ATP can be regenerated through respiration time and time again. Respiration occurs in mitochondria. Now, a common misconception people have is that photosynthesis happens in plants, respiration happens in everything else. Well, respiration does happen in everything else, but it also happens in plants because that chemical energy that's produced by the plant through photosynthesis, the plant still needs that energy to grow and develop, to move, to respond to the environment. And so plants are also engaging in the process of respiration. They're taking the sunlight, converting it to a usable form, and then converting it into ATP for their own personal use. Um, regulation again, this ties back in with homeostasis and responding to the environment. Um, the jackrabbit's ears here, again we talked about that earlier, being really large so that we can have that heat exchange with the environment. Okay, Homeostasis is a key thing. And as we talked about before, we have both positive, which is reinforcing feedback, and we have negative feedback, which is kind of balance, we can consider it balancing. It shuts off the system. The living world, we're talking about the hierarchy of life here. We're going to start um, it, and jump around in various phases of this hierarchy throughout this year um, and try and tie in the microbiology. So, for example, how respiration works or what um, glucose physically looks like and then branch it out into that, that bigger, that organismal level or that ecosystem level. So the living world is really this hierarchy here that we're talking about. If we think at the top level, it's the biosphere, and that biosphere is all the living things that are the living surface of our planet. Okay, breaking it down into ecosystems, which are really defined, or ecosystems kind of biomes as well, which are really going to be defined by temperature and precipitation. That's really going to shape what kind of plant life can form in an area. And what kind of plant life can form and grow and develop in an area and lead to stability is really going to dictate what types of animals and other organisms can move in. Okay. Communities, then, are all of the different living things that are present in um, a, a given space. So it is, um, at this point, all biotic. A community is all biotic. Ecosystems are the last level where we have both biotic and abiotic. Once we get to the community, we're talking strictly about those biotic factors, okay? Um, the wolves, the deer, the worms, the bacteria, the trees, the flowers, all that live in a given, given space. Each of those things is considered a population. 
populations being a group of the same organism living in the same place and the same time. And it's that population level where um, we're really concerned with evolution occurring, where natural selection really occurs, and where gene exchange really occurs. Populations are then in turn made up of individual organisms as seen by the tree here. So that um, the, the organism here is that single maple tree. Several of these organisms make up a population. So here we have a population of ma maple trees, population of maple trees made up of individual organisms, individual maple trees. Each individual is then in turn made up of different organs and organ systems. So you're made up of a digestive system, an, um, a nervous system, an excretory system. And each of those systems in turn is made up of an organ. So for example, your digestive system, one of its organs is your stomach. Another would be considered your liver. Another would be considered your small intestine. Each of those is then made up of particular types of tissues, smooth muscle, muscle, muscle tissue, fat tissue, um, nervous tissue. All of those things make up each of those organs. Now we start getting down to what we consider the smallest unit of life, and that is the cell. The cell is the smallest part of an individual that's still considered alive. Okay? Cells can go through all of those different characteristics of life. Cells, in turn, are made up of their own organ systems, so organelles such as mitochondria, the nucleus, um, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus. And in turn, each of those is then made up of molecules and atoms. And this represents that entire hierarchy of life.